everyone. Good evening, Eagles. Um, welcome to an evening with the admin. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, before we get started, I do want to point out that our format has changed a little bit. A couple of weeks ago at our site council meeting, Ms. Shin and I had the experience of living with a Zoom bomber for the first, first few minutes of our meeting. Uh, so we got to experience what our teachers experienced early in the year. Uh, to avoid that happening again tonight, we opted to go to a webinar format, which helps us more with security. Uh, but we are looking into other options. So as we have meetings in the future, we do want to have the ability to be able to have you actually voice uh, with, you know, verbally voice your, your thoughts to us in these meetings. So we're investigating how to do that so we can make changes in the future. Uh, before we get started tonight, um, I do want to push uh, things over to Ms. Shin to talk about logistics and then we'll come back and, and address your, your questions. Thank you, Ms. Heinrich. Uh, I do want to let you know that in the webinar format, we do have the Q&A and chat box open. Uh, please feel free to put your questions in, in those two spaces and at the end of our meeting, we will address those questions. Uh, at this point, we are offering language interpretation. Unfortunately, we did have a last minute issue with our Spanish interpretation, so that is not a function that's available, but we will make sure to record uh, tonight's meeting and then make sure that the transcript is translated into Spanish for our Spanish-speaking families. So at this point, if you are a Mandarin uh, speaker, you can look at the very bottom of your screen and you'll see a globe icon. Uh, on that icon, if you go ahead and uh, choose Chinese, uh, the interpretation will start and um, our uh, Chinese community liaison is there in that room to go ahead and host the meeting in Chinese. So again, if you hit that globe icon, you can go ahead and select uh, Mandarin Chinese. Thank you, Ms. Shin. Before we get started tonight, I do want to introduce the members of our panel tonight who's joined us tonight to answer questions. Um, you just heard from Ms. Shin. Ms. Eva Shin is our Assistant Principal of Curriculum and Instruction. Also, we have Assistant Principal Vince Lopez. He oversees athletics, activities, clubs, uh, facilities. Um, also have Assistant Principal Nicholas Janisowski, who oversees student, <clears throat> excuse me, special education, uh, student management with Mr. Lopez. Um, he also deals with attendance and CTE. And then we have a special guest with us tonight, and that's Ms. Ruth Esselm. Um, many of you know her. She was an assistant principal at Gabrielino for 11 years. She's now our director of people services. And we've asked her to join us tonight in case any of you have questions um, related to um, the letter you received or, or actually be there to back us up in case we come across something that maybe we can't answer. We'll, we'll turn it over to her as the expert director in that field. And also thank you to Mandy Ng, um, our, our community liaison who's here tonight to help us translate for our, our Chinese speaking families. Um, the purpose of the evening tonight is we wanted to take or have an opportunity to take a chance to talk to all of you um, since we've been in school now for over a month. And we know that as we've gone through this new experience, you probably have questions and you certainly did. We got a, a list of them submitted last week. And we, we really wanna hear from you and hear what, what's on your mind, um, give you an opportunity to ask us uh, what's happening, what does it look like here at school without our students, even though we're in a virtual academy, and just basically have a, an opportunity to chat. And that's our purpose tonight. We do have a series of questions that were submitted by our families during the last week. We've taken those questions and divided them into four categories. One is the virtual academy, and I will be handling those. We also have curriculum instruction, which will be addressed by Ms. Shin. We have um, health and safety, which will be addressed by Mr. Jasowski. And we'll finish with, uh, with athletics and activities with Mr. Lopez. Once we get through those questions, uh, we'll look at the questions in the chat box, as Ms. Shin said, she'll look at the Q&A and we'll address those as well. Uh, we're planning for our meeting to go an hour in length. So um, with that, I'm going to jump right in and start with uh, questions related to the Virtual Academy. I will read the question and then I'll go ahead and respond. So one of the questions we, re we received is, is the whole school year going to be online? Yes and no. Uh, we will have the virtual academy the entire school year. However, once we transition to a hybrid model, and we don't know when that's going to occur, but when that does occur, the hybrid model is a combination of virtual academy and person-to-person -person instruction. So at that time, students or families who opt to participate in that model 
We'll still be doing, a, we'll be doing a combination of in-person and virtual learning. And then we will also have families who will have chosen to stay uh, in the virtual academy for the rest of the year. So it's kind of a yes and no answer. It, it really is dependent on the choice that families make in terms of what they'd like to do once we move into phase three. Second question we received is, can we still choose to stay with online distance learning five days a week and not, and not be part of the hybrid program? Yes, if families can choose to do that. Um, a letter was sent out electronically last week from, from district leadership. You should all have received that and a hard copy is going out as soon as possible. And Ms. Esselin can comment on that if she'd like. Um, that will, the letter is a copy of what went out electronically and explains the options for families regarding uh, learning, learning choices once we move into a hybrid model. As I mentioned, we do not know yet when that will occur, but because of the number of things that we need to get ready to do that, we'd like to have that information ahead of time. Um, if a family opts for the hybrid schedule, uh, they, uh, they can choose later to go to the virtual academy. So if a family decides, I'd like to try person-to-person -person instruction and then that doesn't work well, they do have the option to move back to the virtual academy. Ms. Esslin, did you want to say anything on that or did I cover that okay? Did I miss anything? No, I think that's good. Okay, great. You can wave at me if I do and then I'll, I'll call on you then. Our third question in this area is, will students who choose to stay with virtual academy have the same access to the daily teaching instructions, instructions excuse me, that are provided to students in the hybrid model? Our hope is that that will occur, that students will zoom into the class and hear the same instruction and see the same instruction that the teachers are presenting to the students who are in the classroom. Uh, we're currently working with our teachers to carefully plan what that will look like, uh, how to plan for those hybrid schedules, how to plan for instructional models to be used within the hybrid schedule. Um, our goal is to minimize the, the disruption of instruction and adhere to state requirements for instructional minutes as much as we possibly can. So our hope is that, that yes, students will receive as close to possible the same instruction, but again, we're working very closely with their staff to, to move forward in that, in that direction. Okay, and that's Virtual Academy questions. I'm going to move it over now to Ms. Shin to address curriculum and instruction. Okay, so the first question in terms of curriculum and instruction is how is teaching and grading different in the Virtual Academy versus traditional school? So, one impact to the learning or to teaching um, and the assignment of work in the virtual environment is that uh, we shifted to a block schedule. So as you know, teachers are being challenged to utilize technology um, as the main platform to deliver instruction. There are some positive effect or impacts uh, to this. And some of those positives are that they're able to use multiple technology tools, they're able to consistently use Google Classroom, and they can incorporate multiple resources in their Zoom class. But with that, there are also some limitations in not being in person. So student-teacher proximity, uh, ease with which teachers can quickly assess and uh, check for understanding, and the re-engagement of students when they become distracted, that is much more difficult in the Zoom environment. So in terms of teaching, those are some of the differences. In terms of grading, uh, while there are some alterations in the platforms and protocols used with virtual uh, learning, um, the assessment, the grading of the assessments and assignments have not changed. Teachers continue to utilize both formal and informal assessments, just like in the traditional environment. The second question are, is um, about AP courses. So are teachers more lenient um, in particular to honors and AP courses? And if so, are we properly preparing students for the AP exam? Uh, teachers grading policies are consistent with the traditional schedule. Um, and the expectations are the same. There's not an expectation that teachers should be more lenient and AP courses are still designed to help prepare students for the exams that are given in May. Uh, the rigor of the exams has not been altered during the pandemic and so teachers have not altered the rigor in their classrooms. Um, I think with that though, with um, AP students, if you're concerned, there's always um, you know, additional training that they can do on their own just to make sure that they are uh, ready for that test in May. The next question has to do with summer school and it's asking about language or art classes offered um, at GAB during the summer. So traditionally, uh, in terms of advancement courses or what we call get ahead courses, those are offered through the CEPH Academy. 
So Spanish and art have been offered in the past, but the decision of what to offer in next year, it, we won't happen, it won't happen until the spring. So last year, uh, summer school was not offered on site, and we don't really know next year if we're going to be considering a virtual or hybrid model uh, if in-person teaching comes back. So um, that again, will, that information will be decided in the spring and that information will be passed on to you um, at that point. And we will make sure that summer programs follow any health guidelines that have been adjusted to the season at that time. My last question in this area um, has to do with homework. And the questions specifically pertain to uh, the quantity of homework and then homework for freshman students. So um, homework is determined by teachers and their respective departments. So if your student has a specific issue with a particular class, what we wanna do is encourage you to reach out or have your student reach out to the teacher so that communication happens on a per class uh, basis. Um, while concerns or questions regarding the quantity of homework um, in a specific class should also be discussed between the student and the teacher, we as an admin team are continuing to examine the homework policy in light of the change to tra from traditional to virtual learning. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and pass on to our next panelist, who is Mr. Janiszewski. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Ms. Shin. So we're now gonna talk about questions pertaining to the health and safety of our students and staff. So the first question was, when will the school be making preparations for the safety of our students? Uh, please know that the district and the school have been working on this currently and for some time. Uh, classrooms have been measured and signage is up. Uh, we are also working on the identification process to make sure that there's separate edge entrance and exits for our students as well. Um, we're also working on the distance measuring for students during passing periods uh, to ensure that there is enough space to, per our guidelines and that students will be able to move swiftly to class, but at the same time, very safely. Um, the next question is, will there be plexiglass and air filters to help mitigate the risks of COVID-19? Uh, the maintenance director is working with the Department of Public Health to determine the needs for moving the campus to a hybrid model. The DPH are, doing, are currently doing walkthroughs that will take place to ensure adherence to health protocols. Um, new air filters were placed in the HVAC systems over the summer as well. So PPE will be provided to all teachers and all students are required to wear masks and that's very important to remind your uh, children of that. However, if kids do happen to forget their masks, which they might forget some things from time to time, we will have one readily available for them, a disposable mask. So um, the next question was, what type of extra supervision will be provided to ensure that the children are safe here at school? Um, well, we will be working with our staff and our district to provide supervision as we would in a normal setting. So with that, we will also have our security team and our administration making sure that students um, are being supervised on a regular basis as they normally would be. Uh, and with that, we're also making sure that within the classroom, our teachers are monitoring students as well to make sure that they are socially distanced and they are practicing um, you know, a safe and healthy environment as well. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the next question was, how often will they be disinfecting areas uh, where people and children are? GHS will follow the DPH, got, uh, excuse me, the DPH guidelines. Desks and surfaces will be disinfected after each class with the appro appropriate wait time to ensure that the solution does dry. Teachers will disinfect the materials used between classes as well. So this might take a little time to getting used to, but it's something that our teachers and staff are committed to. The last question will be, Will there be extra help to disinfect the entire school? The districts and maintenance team will provide, will be adhering to health protocols. In addition, the district is continuing to explore options to mitigate these risks. Please see the return to learn plan that's located on our website, our school website, and also our district website as well. And please know that our district is doing everything they can to ensure the safety of your children here at school. 
I will now pass it on to uh, Ms. Heinrich. <laughs> I actually have two, two questions in the, the health and safety area that, that I wanted to, to address. So one of the questions that came up was how would the parents or how will parents know if it's really safe for children to be on campus? And, and what, we're do, what I can, can only do is assure you that we're doing the best that we can to mitigate uh, the, the, the spread of the virus and to mitigate situations in which children would, would not be safe. So we will be following all guidelines that are established by the public of health. Uh, we're looking at all the guidelines for cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfecting, because there are actually different guidelines for each of those three things. Uh, we will have PP, PPP, bah, <laughs> too many P's there. PPE and hand, hand sanitizer stations will be available during that time for when kids come back. And physical distancing is going to be critical along with the wearing of masks. Uh, those are the key areas that we will be focusing on. We do have a meeting with the Assistant Superintendent of Business Services, the Director of Operations, the District Nurse, uh, next Tuesday to walk the campus with us to identify areas and where we will be putting hand, hand sanitizing stations, um, how we can distance, taking a look at all the classrooms. Although we have already measured them, we still wanna walk through them to ensure that uh, we're meeting all the appropriate needs uh, for when the time comes when we are uh, ready to have children come back. Uh, students will be screened when they come to campus. We are asking parents to screen their children before sending them to school, but we will also screen them again when they get here. If a child uh, doesn't pass the screening, we will have a separate area for that child to go to while we contact the parents to come and pick up, pick up their child. We, would like, we are going to do our best to mitigate circumstance, uh, circumstances and, and the disease as much as we can, as I said. But I think it's important to note that we can't 100% guarantee that all children will be 100% safe on the campus. Uh, we, we can't do that at this point, but we will do everything possible to mitigate situations that would expose children to the virus. All right. Um, the second question is, do we have school police? And if we do, are we planning to defund them? No, we do not have school police here at Gabrielino. Uh, the district is, works in partnership with the San Gabriel Police Department. Uh, they, we have a program called the Community Engagement uh, Program or Plan. And we work with SG, uh, SGPD. So we do have Officer Dane Woolwine who works with us and is, supports us whenever we need him. So while we do not have officers on site, if we do have a situation in which there is need for police to be here at Gabrielino, we call Officer Woolwine and he either comes himself or he has uh, colleagues, other officers come to assist us. The, we have this plan now for I think going on three years, possibly four, and it's been highly effective in terms of community policing. Our, the officers have gotten to know our kids. Our kids know them when they see them in the community and it's been a very worth, worthwhile project. So no, we are not defunding police because we do not have police here in our district. Uh, we work in partnership with San Gabriel PD. All right, with that, I am now going to transition over to Mr. Lopez to talk about athletics and activities. Vince, Vince, you need to unmute. Mr. Lopez, you're muted. Oh, there we go. Okay, sorry. Thank you. I'm all sure right, it was really good. Uh, put it all over again. Yeah, it was, I was, I was Whatever working. you said, we, really, we missed something. <laughs> um, all right, so the first question I have is what sports are available at GHS? Uh, what plans are, or what are the plans for sport tryouts and how will we be notified? Um, the school and district leadership is working to put together in place measures that will enable students to return to campus in coordination with the CIF's season of schedule. Uh, decisions will be made on the guidance put forth by the Department of Public Health and the CIF. The second question, other schools are doing athletic conditioning on campus with a schedule to prevent crowding at the school. Can we start this? We have enough space on the fields. Once again, the school and district leadership are waiting for guidance from the LA County Office of Public Health on protocols to return to athletes to school. GHS will work with district leadership on measures that will enable us to bring the athletes back on campus. 
The third question, will Gabrielino sports such as swimming return this school year? If daily swim practice and swim meets do take place, how will they look in terms of social distancing? Well, we're hoping to have swim this spring and we will work with the coaches and county officials on guidelines related to the pool deck and the pool area. So once again, student safety is the priority. So we will get direction um, from those, those groups. Um, the last question I have, uh, will there be clubs this year, either in-person, hybrid, or distant? If so, how do our kids find out to join these clubs? We are currently doing our club rush and on our website, we have a, a button posted that runs a slideshow of all the clubs that are currently being uh, marketed on our campus. So you would go to that slideshow. It's under recent news on, on our website. Click on the, the club start, the club rush start, and then that'll give you uh, the idea of what clubs are in place. You can also reach out to the ASB advisors or the ASB students. Um, and they can tell you uh, the, the status of an existing club or uh, an upcoming club. Club Rush will run through October 16th and at October 16th we will close our Club Rush and then we will post the official clubs of Gabrielino on our website so you'll know uh, if they've been sanctioned or not. So right now we're just in a recruitment phase but we will do clubs. If we go to hybrid uh, then we will look to see if we can have person-to-person uh, -person meetings. But as it stands right now, everything will be virtual. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Those were all the questions that were submitted to us last week. So at this point in time, we'll take, uh, take the opportunity to answer any questions that are in the Q&A or in the chat. There is one question in the Q&A, and it's regarding um, athletics. So Mr. Lopez, I'm gonna throw this one to you. The question is, if seniors dropped their conditioning class, will they be able to rejoin practices in hybrid? Yeah, the, the conditioning class is, is set uh, for a traditional schedule because we would have um, facility needs. So in COVID, uh, we won't schedule any practices in that, that time period. So you will be able to participate in the athletic programs because the, the, the practices and games, well, the practices will be scheduled outside of that instructional day. So if you're not in the sixth grade class, that doesn't exclude you from the athletic team. Thank you, Ms. Lopez. Another question on athletics. Can you participate in athletics if you stay in the virtual academy? Yes. So as long as you're a part of the, the school community, you're, you're eligible to be a, a participant on the athletic teams whether it's in a virtual academy or a hybrid setting. Thank you. We do have a question in the chat uh, regarding uh, the bathrooms. So a parent is asking about restroom cleaning and will there be updates to make sure that there's appropriate water temperature in the class, or excuse me, in the restrooms and that water flow is, is suitable for the washing of hands for the recommended 20 seconds. Yes, that's part of the guidelines that are in the return to learn plan that's posted at our website and also the district website is that um, in the past, our, our custodians are in a physical setting, I should say, um, our custodians clean the bathrooms at certain times of the day. Those will be in, uh, we will have more, more, can't talk tonight. We will have more cleaning opportunities uh, during the course of the day because we have to make sure that surfaces are cleaned uh, in a continual according to a continual, continual plan or route. So right now, with the very few people on campus, we have all of our, our handles and bathrooms cleaned in the morning, again midday, and again in the afternoon. That particular plan will not work when we go into a hybrid because the number of people on the campus will be significantly higher. So yes, the plan will be, is being put into place at that time to ensure that bathrooms are being cleaned and water temperature flow, those types of questions will be addressed when we go through our walkthrough uh, that I mentioned is going to occur next week. The next question is, will the school or district consider looking into a, co a contact tracing app? For example, my work uses Citizen Safe Pass to track daily symptoms, uh, contact tracing, et cetera. I know my friend utilizes it at her job at UCI on a daily basis, just a thought. Um, thank you for the thought. 
Uh, this was actually a conversation I had with our district nurse, Kathy Leone, today. Uh, the, she has been looking at a number of different apps that could be used, uh, not only for contact tracing, but also for screening. And she hasn't quite decided if there's one that is the most appropriate. Um, in fact, we had a conversation with the Department of Public Health officials asking them, what do they recommend? Is there one that really works? Uh, what we are discovering as we're in this, this new world is that there are many comp companies and organizations that are going into business now and making money um, by creating apps, by selling a sanitizer, by coming up with, with solutions to meet the needs that we're now facing during this time frame. So our question is, which ones are the most viable, the most cost effective? What's going to give us the data that we need? So, so in answer to your question, it, we're looking at it. We're, we're going to make decisions based on what works best for the district. Uh, but again, our, our goal is to make sure that we can get our kids onto the campus efficiently and safely uh, when they come back in, in a hybrid situation. Okay. All right, then we have a question. Um, all right, I'm actually gonna give this one to, to Ms. Essel. So Ms. Essel, if one child, uh, if one child wait, um, one child decides to continue with virtual learning and the other child wants to do hybrid, is that feasible? Can, can that happen? Yes, it can. And that is why each family needs to fill out the survey for every child that they have, because it is a student by student um, decision and it is a unique student planning process that we would go through if we are moving to hybrid. Thank you. Mr. Lopez, if sports resume, will all sports be available, specifically football? We're hoping to have all the sports that we currently offer here at Gabriel and Wise. So yes, if we, we want to have all the sports. Again, we're, we're following the, the guidelines set forth by the, the County Health Office. Thank you. We have a question in the Q&A. What is the protocol for when a staff or student tests positive for COVID? So I'm gonna go ahead and take that. Uh, the protocols for if, if we have a student test positive or a staff member test positive, the, the individual, the student, the staff member has to go into quarantine for 14 days. Also, anyone that they came in contact with also has to go into quarantine for 14 days. If, if, uh, COVID, if, if people that they have been in contact with also uh, exhibit symptoms of COVID, that's part of the contact tracing. And we would have that, we would be working with the school nurse, the Department of Health, in terms of making sure that all individuals that have been associated with anyone that has been identified as having COVID is alerted to that so that they can quarantine as well. So it'd be a 14, a 14 day quarantine. In most cases, it would mean that we'd probably have to shut down any class that that teacher is teaching or the students that are in those classes but also have to be shut down to go through the 14-day quarantine and then that is per department of health protocols all right um what is the deadline for the hybrid questionnaire and when will we know the results so miss eslin i'm throwing that one to you so the letter that was sent home via email and will be arriving um, through the postal service sometime next week states that the deadline is October 13th for when the survey needs to be completed. And we have parent meetings happening at every grade level span to accommodate parents' needs to process their decision making in this regard. So with regards to the results, I'm not quite clear what that means, what the results would, may, would be. Um, any family can contact me to verify um, that what they answered is what they meant for it to be on their survey. But as far as the results, we are just taking that data, the number of students who intend to return, so that if we do move in the hybrid direction, we know how many students we need to accommodate and plan for. Thank you. We have a couple more virtual academy questions. Uh, will the virtual academy keep the same schedule once you start the hybrid model? Uh, I'll go ahead and take that one. We're still working on that. 
um, right now. Uh, there's conversations are occurring between district leadership, teachers, and we're working closely with our teaching staff uh, to determine what, what that's going to look like. So at this point in time, I can't say that's going to be the same schedule. We're determining what's going to work the best as we move into the, into the hybrid model. There's also a question about, in a hybrid model, where will students eat lunch? Again, I wish I could give you a definitive answer. That's another area that we're working on. Uh, as, as you all know, it's important that our stu students stay physically distanced uh, while they're at lunch. And teenagers love to get together and talk and spend time, and lunch is a big break and a big part of their day. So uh, keeping 500 students apart, if we get that many back uh, during a hybrid, Will be a little bit of a challenge. So there, there are options that we're investigating to ensure that students are kept physically distanced during lunch. So where they will eat, it may be multiple places on the campus. So we're still working on that um, with leadership and with our teachers. Sharon, can I add to that? Mm -hmm. So some of the parents have asked why the survey now? And I think that question about lunch captures that exactly, that we need to make a plan based on knowing how many students are coming back. So as Ms. Heinrich said, right, if there are 500 students coming back, then we will make a plan for those 500 students. If we have 1,500 students coming back, then the plan will look dramatically different. So uh, we're in a chicken and egg sort of situation where families want to know from us exactly what's happening, but we need to know from families who's coming back so we can tell you what's going to happen. So um, I just want to acknowledge that some parents have, have asked uh, questions about the timing, um, and that is and that is why. Um, I think there's one more question coming up, Sharon, about hybrid. Yes, so there's one more question. Is how many students will be in a class during hybrid sessions? And has a limit been set? Oh, that one's for Vince or, or you. I yeah, that's, that yeah you're, you're up the hook. If I find another one, I will call upon you. Uh, right now, uh, we've measured classrooms and we're expecting classes to be, or classes are in a classroom setting to be no more than 12 people in order to maintain the six foot physically, physical distancing that's required. Uh, so, so the limit would be 12. And if you're familiar with our campus, these would be our classes like B148, B149, our typical classroom. In classes that are larger, such as the choir room or the band room or a PE class that would be out on the field, classes could be larger because there is more room to distance the students. But in a typical academic core type class, the number would be 12. Um, a parent is also asking, uh, which is going down, a question about virtual academy in terms of uh, if a family goes virtual, virtual academy, will there be different teachers uh, for the virtual academy course versus the in-person course? Um, as we mentioned a little bit earlier in, in the presentation, the, our hope is that our students will be able to zoom in with the teacher that they are currently assigned to, so that the teacher would be, ha would have, be working person to person or face to face with the students in their class, but also students who are in virtual academy would be listening in on that instruction. So that is our hope. Uh, we are currently working with our teachers to determine what that will look like, what type of instructional strategies will we need to use, what will the curriculum look like. So that is our hope. That's what we're working towards. But I can, at this point in time, give you a definitive answer. Sharon, I think there's one question that maybe got skipped. Sorry, a little echo there. Is it in the chat or in the Q&A? It's in the chat. And I'm just going to jump in so you can continue. Go right ahead. Um, it says, well, this question has come up. So what's happening is that families are having uh, evolving conversations. So if, you're, if you go in and you fill out the survey for one of your children, and then after talking, you change your mind, just submit it again. The, the form is set up to allow multiple submissions. And so what we'll just do it, you know, those of you who know Google Forms, it just goes into Google Sheets and we will look for duplicates. And the, the timestamp that is the most recent will be what gets locked in on October 13th for our planning. Um, so yes, go ahead and have those ongoing conversation with your children, change your mind five times, but on October 13th, that's when the survey will close. Thank you. 
All right. Um, we're going to be jumping between the Q&A. Uh, there's another hybrid question. Uh, why won't parents have the opportunity to switch from virtual to hybrid at the semester break? Seems very early. Okay, I think we've answered this. Seems very early to decide now for the entire school year, especially when you don't have details for how this will work. I think we've addressed that. Ms. Sussland, do you think there's anything we need to add? I think maybe the why is helpful, right? So when people read the letter, a lot of the questions that we've had are about this movement. So if, if a family decides to have their student go back for in-person learning, and then it, it, it doesn't work and they decide to go home, we have more space in the classroom for physical distancing. But if you go the other direction, if you start with virtual and you want to now enter the classroom setting, we have, again, done all of this very detailed work, right? Gabrielino staff will do some very detailed work to determine how many students are in that space. And so we can't add students into the physical space because it will have set, been set up specifically with the health guidelines. So that's why, you, that's why families can start in person and go virtual, but they can't start virtual and then go in person. Thank you. We have a question related to the hybrid start date. And the question is asking if the start date is based on where Los Angeles stands on the watch list. And, and yes, it, 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 yes and no. Uh, we can't consider moving to a hybrid approach until the, the county has moved out of, we're currently in the purple, we're in the highest level. We have to move out, we have to be off that list for 14 days. And then 14 days beyond that, we have to wait another 14 before we consider bringing students back. So that's, that's 28 days before we could consider even reopening. So, so yes, uh, the start date is based on where Los Angeles County stands. But there are also other factors that have to be taken into consideration in terms of when we open. Um, it's, if anyone's been watching what's happening in Orange County, there is, um, you'll notice that schools are opening at different times. Not all districts, it wasn't that Orange County came off the watch list and then immediately every single district in the, in the county opened. That is not what's been happening, is that each district is assessing their needs and what works for their families and their community and then based on that, our, our reopening. So, so once, if you see Los Angeles move, we move from purple to red, that doesn't automatically mean that we're, we're going to hybrid immediately. There, there are other factors that have to be taken into consideration. All right, let me just take a quick look through. Um, we have a couple we've already, have already addressed in the beginning of the, of the presentation, but I think I wanna go back since we do have a question is what safety precautions are you implementing in classrooms regarding the ventilation and disinfecting? So Mr. Jensowski, that was originally a question that you answered. Would you mind uh, going over that one again? Yes, um, so in terms of inside the classrooms, during the summer, um, the entire HVAC system had uh, new filters placed inside. Uh, so that was one of the steps that we took to make sure inside buildings, inside the career center, inside offices, uh, inside any structure here, uh, that it would be uh, cleaned with a, we'll have a new filter that was clean. Uh, the second thing is, and maybe I wanna reiterate or go over this again, in some districts um, at each student desk, there are plexiglass uh, trifolds. Uh, unfortunately, uh, right now, that is not the case for uh, uh, San Gabriel, or at least Gabrielino. However, students will be spaced appropriately um, according to DPH guidelines, and the teacher will have a plexiglass shield in front of them as well. And there will be some plexiglass shields in uh, several of our offices, which currently there are right now as we speak. Um, so teachers will also be disinfecting rooms uh, between periods and ensuring that students are coming in in an orderly fashion and uh, our admin team and our uh, campus safety team will be making sure that students are moving uh, swiftly uh, but very carefully at a safe distance as well. Right, and I would just like to, to add on in terms of the plexiglass and just to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, there's uh, right now the Department of Public Health is not requiring 
plexiglass unless it's person, you know, face-to-face -face communication that's occurring. Uh, the guidelines for classrooms is that students need to be at desks six feet apart facing forward. Uh, we had actually had a conversation today with Kathy Leo and our district nurse and the Department of Public Health regarding plexiglass. And with high schoolers, what they, what they have found is that plexiglass is either too short, that when a student stands up, they're now above it, or that if it doesn't, and when it turns, comes to the side, if a student turns to the side, it also doesn't help there either. The student can still, you know, if we're too close, uh, the student can still um, spread germs that way. So it, what the Department of Public Health is saying, or saying is that really the best precautions in a classroom is that everyone is wearing a mask, Everyone is, is six feet apart, facing forward, and that materials, desktops are all sanitized between each, each student. When a student leaves the classroom, classroom sanitized, materials used during that particular class period are sanitized before the next group comes in. So I do want to point out, though, that everything regarding uh, this virus changes and is dynamic. And even the Department of Public Health told us that today, that guidelines are dynamic and can change. So we'll certainly be keeping a close eye on that um, in terms of what's going to be the best thing to do for, for our students. Uh, we were, to, again, I should also mention that uh, the Department of Public Health officials did say that where they are seeing partitions used are in districts that can't physically distance. So in classrooms where you can't, you know, they have 20 kids or 30 kids, and they can't, they can't manage the six foot separation, but that's largely where uh, the plexiglass partitions are being used. You will notice if you come onto campus, uh, we are limiting that. We really don't want you to come onto campus. But if you were to come onto campus, you would notice that we already have plexiglass in place in our offices so that as uh, visitors to our campus have to interact with people who work here, that there is plexiglass dividers. We are all wearing masks, even though we have that, again, because we want to make sure we're, we're following public health guidelines and doing everything that we can uh, to minimize exposure. I, if I can add one more thing, uh, Mrs. Heinrich, uh, mm -hmm. I think it's also a great idea, parents out there, to just, you know, as part of a, a routine conversation to have with your son or daughter, uh, to make sure that they're reminded of uh, their own responsibility in practicing social distancing and keeping each other safe and their peers safe as well, too. Thank you. Uh, we have a question uh, regarding funding. And does the school get different funding for students who attend in person versus students who are 100% virtual? Nope, there's not a difference in funding. The funding is the same whether students are here uh, person to person instruct for person to person instruction or if they're in a virtual in the virtual academy 100%. Uh, the funding is there's no differentiation in the funding. Uh, another question is about um, classes. Will particular classes be in, in person? Uh, the question says, since the hybrid models are twice a day, is there a certain set of classes that will be in person? For example, are all language arts going to be virtual and all science classes in person, et cetera? Um, and she, um, sorry, she meant twice a week. So um, no, at this point in time, the plan is when we go to hybrid that it's a combination, that the classes would be in person with uh, virtual academy. So students will still have virtual academy classes. Uh, we're not at this point in time uh, looking at one particular department being one way, another department being another. However, we are, you know, as I said, we're still working with our, our, our teachers and working on planning. So I don't know if that's an idea that's being, being discussed. It, it certainly has not been one that I've seen come across my desk. All right. Um, if other, oh wait, let me. Okay, then uh, we've got a question about after school pickup. Will there be a staff outside of the school to monitor kids to safely social distance while waiting for parent pickup? Uh, the answer to that is yes, uh, there will be. Uh, we will have four exit points on the campus. We cannot have all of our students exiting through the same, uh, the same exit. And again, that's because of physical distancing guidelines. So where your child uh, exits, you'll have to you know, determine that with your child when the time comes and when we announce what those exits are. Uh, we will have to use security to monitor that kids are staying apart. However, I, I will tell you that we are looking at uh, how we're going to do that. It may mean staggered release times in classrooms. Uh, it's part of the planning that we're talking about right now because it's going to be very difficult. Uh, it's one of the things that keeps me up at night is figuring out how to keep 500 kids separated when they're coming into, camp into campus 
when they're leaving campus, and even when they're moving from class to class. So it's an area that we're very well, area that we're working on, very much aware of. And um, again, as I said, we're still, our hope is that we'll have it all figured out by the time that we go to hy hybrid, but that, you know, to reiterate what Ms. Esselin said, it's why we did the survey now. We're trying to get an idea of the numbers so that we can actually have the plans in place that we need so that we have a smooth transition when the time comes. All right, that, unless I'm missing a question, uh, I'm gonna take another quick look at q and I think. Wait, here we go. I did miss some, sorry about that, everybody. Uh, will teachers have a choice with in-person versus virtual teaching? If they choose to do virtual, how will hybrid look? So um, we are asking, our teachers are expected to come back to, to campus. Um, we, would go, we, would, we would be going back to, uh, it's a hybrid setting, we're going back to school. So we are expecting our teachers to come back to, to, come back to teach in person. Um, if they choose to do virtual, it would be because there's a health reason. There's a, a health reason that prohibits them from coming back to campus. And we will work with those instructors should that, should that arise. I um, mean, once again, our hope is that we will be able to have our teachers teach in the hybrid model that, that while they're teaching our students person to person, that, that they would also be teaching our virtual academy kids at the same time. So again, still working out uh, how that will look. Uh, will we be taking students' temperatures when they come back to school? Yes, that is the plan. That, uh, as I mentioned, we want parents to check and screen their students before they come to school. Please, please keep your child home. If they're exhibiting symptoms, if they are feeling ill, please don't send them to school. Uh, but we will check them when they get here. So we will be doing temperature checks when they arrive. Okay, and the last one is a question that um, I've already answered before, but I'll, I'll mention it one more time. Is um, if hybrid does go forth, what is the plan to monitor bathroom time, breaks and lunch time? Will someone be on watch to keep safe distancing and will they be allowed additional time and not marked late to classes, et cetera? Um, I can't answer that one right now because it, as I said, we're still working on what the schedule will look like. Um, I've got to see how much time there is between classes and movement between classes. But yes, we will certainly take that in, into consideration because we need our students to make sure that they're washing their hands frequently. We wanna make sure that they're visiting the hand sanitation stations. We wanna make sure that they're that they're doing everything they need to do to be responsible and safe. So yes, that is a consider consideration we will take into mind that we will have staff here to monitor distancing. But I wanna reiterate what Mr. Janisowski said, we really need the kids help too, because there's more of them than there is of us. And so we really need them to help us and that they follow direction, that they practice physical distancing, that they wear their masks. If we can do all of those things, we're gonna do pretty well. Will it show on transcripts whether kids were hybrid or remote? I'm actually gonna give Ms. Shin a chance to, to say something. That's a curriculum question. Ms. Shin, I'm gonna let you have that one. Thank you. <laughs> um, no, actually that will not be reflected on the transcript and every child will have an equitable chance to earn that grade in the class. So again, um, the hybrid and the remote selection uh, will not be reflected on the transcript. Thank you. Yeah, and Ms. Heinrich, I do want to go back. Um, I think there was a question about where the uh, email was sent uh, in terms of parents, and then there was another parent who actually jumped in and said that uh, it went to her junk mail. So I think I just want to encourage parents to check uh, there as well to make sure that they received it. And again, as Ms. Esselm said, uh, they are going to be sending an actual a hard copy uh, mailed out uh, letter as well so that that will, that will follow shortly, I believe. Thank and the you. link is at the link is at the district website. It's just a Google form. I think there was a question about whether it was a third party vendor, but um, it was me. It was my email address, so you can just look for me. If you feel like the email went to an email address that you don't want the district to use, then uh, I would encourage you to get in touch with one of the office staff members at Gabrielino because it is a reflection of data that was entered during the registration process. And um, what happens is that the email system picks up particular areas in your child's, in your child's student information system screen. And so again, you have the ability to call the school and have those fields looked at and potentially updated if you would like. 
Thank you. Uh, we have a question regarding cohorts A and B and whether or not if you're in cohort A or if you're in cohort B, if that means a different day or a different start time. Uh, what we, again, we haven't done a plan yet, so I can't really answer whether that'll be a start time or whether that will be the division of the classes. Uh, one of the ideas we had talked about was you know, right now our classes are 36 for academic courses, uh, depending on how parents respond. It'd be wonderful to have a three-way split, 12, 12, and 12, but that, you know, in a perfect world, that'd be great. Probably won't happen that way. But that's what we're looking at, is looking at the classes, as part of the class is cohort A, part, is co part of it is cohort B, and then the third would be the virtual academy students. So, but again, that's all in discussion. So I, please don't take that as, that is definitely what's happening. We don't know that yet. Uh, I just wanna reiterate again, we are in the planning stages. So uh, we'll, we're certainly gonna be talking about that. And I want to assure everybody that when we do get to the point where the, we're beyond the planning, and we know what the direction is, we will let you know that. We will definitely have you informed uh, before. You will not be informed on Friday that we're starting hybrid on Monday. We will definitely have information out to you well in advance of that. Okay, how can the school assure families that learning is indeed equitable? All right, that's a tough one. And I'm gonna go and take that and anyone else on the panel, feel free to jump in. We are working really hard and hoping that our, that our learning is equitable, but we know that we have students with unique needs, whether it's uh, students with special, who are in special education, our English language learners. Uh, there are a multitude of reasons that students may struggle with learning, and we are aware of that. And we're also well aware that the virtual academy is not the best uh, approach for teaching. We, we know that. We all know that person-to-person -person instruction is the model. It's a model that we are used to. It's a model that we have the data to prove that it works, and we would love to have that. Unfortunately, we're in a situation where we don't have control of all of that. So in the virtual academy, we are doing the absolute best that we can to ensure that learning is, is equitable. Um, I am very proud of our district for the steps that they've taken to provide our teachers with tools to, to, to change how their instruction looks in this setting. That our teachers have, have had to completely change how they teach. Instead of having students and desks in front of them, they're now looking at face tiles on a computer screen and they're having to look at how to work collaboratively while you're working on a computer. And how do you use random questioning when you're working on a computer? And uh, they have, the, we've had a, a great deal of professional development that took place in the summer to provide teachers with tools like Nearpod, uh, for example, or Edpuzzle. Um, that's just two examples of, of, the, of the different types of applications that were shared uh, with our teachers. But even with that, uh, the last Wednesday of every month, PD is offered to our teachers to continue their learning. We also have instituted, uh, we have teacher mentors, tech mentors, that are, that are focusing strictly on instruction in a tech, technical setting or virtual setting. So I'm, I'm really pleased at the efforts that have been made by our district to do as much as, much as we possibly can to maintain or to ensure that we have equitable learning. But can I say it's 100% equitable? No, I can't. We're, but all I can say is that we are doing our absolute best to try to be as equitable as we can. We wanna make sure our kids are supported. That is why our, our schedule was built with the Wednesday intervention day to allow time for our teachers to work with our students on those days, especially with our, our students with the greatest needs. Is it perfect? You know, again, no, but I think we, we are doing the absolute best that we can. Uh, would anybody else on the panel like to add to that? I, I just wanted to also share that San Gabriel is partnering with uh, LA County Office, Office of Education to train our staff in trauma-informed instruction because the research is showing that for many of our students, being home during this pandemic is affecting them like trauma. And so what is even more important is that then the next phase of this training, uh, we have a responsibility, especially with our homeless and our foster youth, to take additional steps to support those populations. And so schools that have homeless and foster youth will get an additional layer of training in how to support those special populations. So we know that, uh, and I agree with everything Ms. Heinrich said about the efforts that are being made and that um, it's, a very, it's a big challenge. We also know, um, and certainly Gabrielino knows, that we need to go the extra mile 
for those that bring additional challenges to our world right now and their world. Thank you. Uh, there is a question, it's not really a question, but actually a recommendation. I think it's a good one. I'd just like to share it. Uh, one of our parents is recommending that when we're closer to you know, the plan being further along and we're getting closer to, to opening that we, we share pictures or do a virtual tour of what the campus looks like as students get ready to come back to school. And I think that's a, a great idea and certainly one that we will, we will take into consideration. Ms. Shin is shaking her head. She's kind of our, uh, our video guru. Uh, we will put her to work on that, but I think that's a great idea, especially since we don't, as mentioned in the, the post, that we're not sure what's going to happen with open house. And for our ninth grade parents, I think it's important for them to actually see uh, what, what is the space that your child will be coming to when we, when we move to hybrid. So thank you for that idea. It's a great one, and we'll definitely look into that. Okay, I think we've missed... Um, that we've missed, or not missed, but addressed all of the questions. We've got about six minutes left. Is there uh, anything else that, that you'd like to ask? There was one question, Mrs. Heinrich. Um, it was written in Chinese. Um, okay. Thank you to Google for helping me uh, translate that. Um, but uh, it asked about whether or not parents needed to have all students or each student in their family uh, submit a, a response to the, the Google form. And, and I think Ms. Esselin answered that earlier. Yes, every single student, uh, whether you have three in your family that attend um, in SGOC, all students should be reflected in that survey. Thank you, Ms. Shin. Um, our hope, this was our first night of doing an, an evening with the admin, and our plan is to, to do more of these. I think that it's critical uh, during this time that we, that we keep the communication lines open. Um, I, I miss meeting with PTA, our PTSA, when we have our monthly meetings, that was always our chance to see each other and talk and socialize, and we don't get to do that anymore. Uh, we do on Zoom, but it's, it's not the same, and that's true for our booster club, it's true for our site council, it's true for all of us who work together. So I, we want to have these, these opportunities to make sure that all of you um, have a chance to engage with us, have a chance to ask us questions, and so we're going to do our best to have one monthly if we can. Um, I'm going to take a moment to say October may not, may not be one in October uh, because in the upcoming weeks, we have a lot on the plate. So I just want to kind of give you a heads up of upcoming events that's for you to take part in. Uh, we do have our, our PTSA meeting on October 7th. We have our school site council meeting the week following, but we are also going to have our first ELAC meeting that first week, of, uh, second week of October. Our Hispanic parent group will be meeting the first week and we'll be getting information out to those parents. We have uh, the Parents as Partners series that is hosted by the district is going to have a session specific to Gabrielino on October 8th. It's going to be a look at the services that we offer here at Gabrielino for college and career readiness. So we strongly encourage you to, to take part in that. Uh, then we will follow up the next week with a financial aid workshop that will be hosted by Gabrielino. So the first two weeks of October are going to be very, very busy. So um, if we we can, we'll try and have another e an evening with the admin at the end of October, but probably we'll, we're looking at the 1st of November, early part of November, and because by that point we should have more information to share with you. So, um, unless uh, we have uh, any other questions, I think, I think we're kind of there. Oh, wait, one more question. Uh, for students requesting the hybrid, will the school require the student to submit a COVID-19 negative test result? At this point in time, we are not asking for test results. And, and again, your questions are appropriate because today in that same conversation with DPH and uh, Ms. Ms. Leon, the Department of Public Health officials told us that the test is really only good for the day that you, that you take it uh, be, or when you get your results because you could be exposed that same day. So it's not a test that once you test negative, then you're negative forever. That, that's not the case. So, uh, Keep that in mind that testing is, we would have to test our kids every single day before they come to campus. And at this point in time, that's probably not feasible. And Department of uh, Public Health agreed with that. Uh, however, again, it's a dynamic situation. We will continue to pay attention to what the guidelines are and the protocols are from the Department of Public Health. And if they say that we should be testing, then the district will investigate how that should happen. So, but at this point in time, uh, we are not, uh, pursuing a testing format such as LAUSD. 
All right, so with that, um, we just about made an hour. So um, thank you, everybody. Thank you for the positive comments in the chat room. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to all of you for being our partners as we go through this. I know it's not easy at home. It's not easy here either. But together, we are rising to the challenge. I think we picked the perfect theme for this year. And I thank all of you for being in it with us. So have a wonderful evening. And we'll see you at the next evening with the admin. Good night, everyone.